What's up, Rangers Nation? It's Alex Plink from Dallas Sports Fanatic, and this is episode five, uh, maybe episode six, I don't know. We had, this is how the Ranger season has been going. We don't know what episode it is because we don't know what week we're on. Uh, this is the Texas Rangers Fanatic podcast, and I am joining today by a special guest, Mr. Levi Weaver of The Athletic, who I'm sure is feeling the same way I am. What game are we on? What day are we on? What, what is today? Today, I happen to know that today is August 5th, but that's only because my wife and I celebrated our 13th anniversary yesterday. So I've got my dates pretty straight. I don't know what day of the week it is, though. I think the Rangers have played like nine games, maybe eight, maybe seven. Maybe well, I can tell you what, they have not played the most games in Major League Baseball and this is going to one of the things we're going to talk about and it's interesting you bring that up because the Rangers have played nine games but you want to know who's played eight games this year the Phillies no kind of close no but the uh, Nationals Brewers Yankees Orioles you want to know what they all have in common? What's that? They've all had a chunk. Well, I don't want to say chunk, but a good portion of their games postponed due to COVID. All right. Okay. So I was on the right track. I just. Yes. Basically gotcha. what I'm saying is that the Rangers on a regular schedule have played one more game than teams who have had two, three, four games postponed this year because of the yeah. way the scheduling and the off days have gone. What a oh man, what a weird schedule. It's not only that, but then when you start to look at who's going to travel the most miles this year, the Rangers are in first place of all major league teams, just basically because they're playing a, a bunch of teams that are in the Western division. So um, yeah, that's crazy. Well, the only reason that they've overtaken that over Houston, because they make two trips to Seattle and Houston makes right. two trips to Oakland. So I guess in right. theory, if that's the payoff that you have to, travel the most miles but you get two trips to seattle instead of two trips to oakland i guess you'll take it yes but also like you're stuck in your hotel room so really how is seattle any different from oakland at that point like it's the hotel room i guess what's going to be interesting is when you only have like three off days left at the rest of the year and you have multiple west coast trips how that's going to work as far as yeah immediately going from Arlington to the West coast and vice versa. I know yeah. in the case this week, Thursday, they have a day game in Oakland tomorrow, and then they'll be heading mm-hmm. back home uh, to take on the angels. So that should be fun. I know usually the opposite you think of, you're like, Oh man, I have a full off day in the Bay area. I can't do anything. And then right. when Thursday and Friday hit, you're kind of like, boy, you're going to use that off day. Yeah. And, and then I guess the, the one thing that might mitigate that a little bit is that West coast game teams are starting their games a little earlier than usual. And the Rangers and Astros, <clears throat> Astros, pardon me, when they're playing West coast teams are starting their games an hour later than usual. So your body, I mean, yes, it's still exhausting to travel and you're sleeping in hotels and all of that, but at least your body's not doing this weird thing where you're having to adjust two hours worth of jet lag every time you go back and forth like it's still happening at roughly the same time every day even though the light's going to be different outside so i guess there's that it begs me to a question on this because i just thought of something when you look at and you know the rangers have been scuffling more than just their offense their bullpen has had their scuffles too Mm -hmm. but if you notice their offensively their worst games seem to be at those eight o'clock hours is there anything to that or is that uh, I think just that they've had a lot of games at those eight o'clock hours is probably would be my guess. That's that's why they've struggled there because they haven't been that great and that's where most of their games have been. Because it seems like their two biggest offensive games come at a three o'clock at home against Arizona and a three mm-hmm. o'clock on the road at San Francisco. So I don't know if that's just coincidentally last game of each series. Yeah. So you could I don't know, um, give or take. I don't know. How did they do in the, the they had a day game against Colorado also, didn't they? They actually scored the most runs in that series, though it was like two. I mean, you could say. But. uh, Yeah, Yeah, well, they scored one, two, and two. And then I think both Saturday and Sunday were day games, right? So. Yeah, Saturday at three o'clock. So I don't know. Something to keep an eye on anyway. But Something to keep an eye on tomorrow and tonight. 
uh, mm-hmm. instead of facing Sean Maniah tonight. And then Mike Fires tomorrow. Oh, kind of yeah, interesting that Fires. interesting that Mike Fires is going to miss the Astros series. Little little yeah, interesting. That would be nice to see him finally face the Astros again, wouldn't it? I'm uh, sure that was a no intention by Bob Melvin and the A's. Yeah, probably. I'll have to ask our uh, our A's writer, Alex Coffey, if that was on purpose or not. Um, I, I actually remember the last time the Rangers faced Mike Fires. That was the day that I raced Tim Dillard in the dot race. And Mike Fires had the weird, like, question mark or whatever beard thing he had going on that day. The facial hair that caught the baseball nation. Yeah. That nobody Man, back copied. when that was... Back when that was like the biggest story about Mike Fires, right? <laughs> remember when, well, just in baseball in general, remember when the biggest thing in baseball was how weird Mike Fires' facial hair was? Mm-hmm. And that caught baseball world. Can we go back to those days? Yeah. Man, Do, have, you, have you caught yourself watching games this year? And like, so I think it was last night or maybe the night before I saw uh, – I think it was last night when, when Chris Woodward took Lance Lynn out of the game and he comes out and he's wearing a mask. I noticed that when Todd Frazier like made a play and he was wearing a mask at first base and it's like, we've been doing this for months now and it's kind of like the norm. It doesn't, it's not weird to me now when I go to a grocery store and see everybody wearing a mask. That's how it should be. It's still once in a while. I just have this sort of like, if 2019 me could sort of, zoom into my brain and look out these eyes and see what I'm seeing and just like how surreal all of this is that this is this is what's normal and like this but it's I mean none of it's normal right but but here's what normal is this year we've got a 60 game season we've got the DH in the NL we've got the extra innings base runner we've got the schedule where you're only playing teams in your division and then also this the same division in the other league uh, you know, everybody's wearing masks. Uh, double headers now are seven innings each. You've got a 30 man roster that's about to be 28 man roster. There are no minor leagues. You've just got these sort of alternate sites. Uh, you've got taxi squads. That's a new thing. I mean, it's almost unrecognizable. And yet here we are. We're doing, and, and, and then, of course, you've got like, oh, by the way, the Marlins have played like four games because they've, <laughs> had people test positive for COVID. You got teams taking a week off at a time. We might have a, we might have a schedule where the NL East is like a seven or eight game difference in number of games played by the end of the season. It's crazy. And the Orioles and Marlins had to be delayed another 45 minutes from original start time because Marlins tests didn't come out in time or I I heard they were inclusive. It just like, at first, I'm like, oh, that's funny. It's a rain delay. No, it's not a rain delay. Right. It was a testing delay. Oh, my gosh. And aren't the Yankees the home team in Philadelphia today? Is that, did I see that right? They're playing, they're playing a doubleheader today, which, by the way, I did a count. For those of you that I, I kind of may think I've lost count, I haven't lost count. So, Levi, I counted. And this year, there has been... 27 games that have been postponed total three due to weather two of them have already been made up white Sox, indians and reds and tigers had their makeup games cubs and reds still have a makeup game which leaves 24 games have been postponed due to covid and and yeah i'm looking at and this. we're in the three yankees weeks are, the yankees are the home team in the first game of the doubleheader and then the Phillies will be back to the home team in the second half of the doubleheader. 2020, man. 2020. It's, and it's like, like, the, yeah, I mean, that, that, the Yankees being the home team in Philadelphia is not like an unprecedented thing. We've seen that before. We've seen weather cause, you know, alternate site games or neutral site games. Like that's the least weird thing about all of it, but it's just, all of this combined is is bonkers. How weird to be in a position where our job is to like, so let me take in all this information and then try and make it make sense for everybody else reading these stories. Like, good luck. Good luck to us. Good luck to everybody. Oh, and it's just, it's just going through like, for example, opening day. 
like mm. opening day, Globe Life Field. I mean, you're figuring every everyone should be excited. And you wake up that morning and you're just like, oh, it's opening day? I went through that whole list earlier where I ranted for like five minutes, forgot to even mention no fans in the stands, yeah. piped in crowd noise, cardboard cutouts. It took I was watching the, the, the Rangers game in Oakland a couple nights ago or last night, whenever it was. Um, there was a foul ball over into the left field seats and it landed in this sparsely populated section of teddy bears. And it took me a few minutes to be like, hang on. That's super weird that there's just like a section of teddy bears. But in 2020, it's like, oh, that's what they decided to do. They went with teddy bears. Good call, Oakland. <laughs> yeah, it's just that's, a matter of, it's not a matter of normal. having cardboard cutouts or it's, it's a matter of what team's going to do what. Right. And right. a question in Oakland, if you're going to hear background noise like you usually do, which I'll give them credit, it sounded like Oakland. They did. They had the vizelas. They had the drums. They, they did a good job there. Um, the twins started doing this thing yesterday. One of our guys wrote a whole story about it where like when the, when the pirates pitcher was pitching from the time he threw the pitch and the catcher caught it, they would start playing music again until he got the ball. So they're playing music the whole time until he steps on the rubber and then they would kill the music, throw a pitch music again until he stepped back on the rubber. And then of course, when their pitcher was on the mound, it was fine. Like it was just regular silence, like a normal baseball game. And it's like, that doesn't seem right, but you know some team was going to try it, and at some point the league is going to have to step in and be like, okay, we didn't want to involve lawyers in the music that's played over the ballpark speakers, but here we go. Here are some very specific outlines of what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. Then there was a drone delay. I never got to the bottom of why there was a drone <laughs> delay, but it was a delay because there was a drone just hovering over the field. Um, I was going to say, hopefully next? they didn't quit pitch. Right. I'm yeah. surprised. What's, I'm surprised they didn't. What? Well, as soon as he stepped on the rubber, they they killed the music. So even if he quick pitched at that point, but still, like, and and so so what's next, Alex? We've had, you know, a drone delay. So uh, you got any guesses for the next <laughs> weird thing to happen to baseball? I mean, logical, I, logical, illogical. I don't know. Yeah, whatever you want. Let's see. Uh, I don't know. The one thing I'm surprised is not too much profanity that you can catch up on. Because I thought I'd be hearing more. I thought I'd be yeah. hearing more profanity. I'm a little I disappointed. Probably, I think they probably, if if I had to guess, I would I would bet that um, the producers have probably pulled the crowd mics down a little bit from what they usually are. You know, you're still hearing the pop of the mitt, so it's it's still there. But um, I would bet that they've scaled that back a little bit, just so that it's not quite picking up as much as they would otherwise have done. I don't think. I, let me see if I can come up with any predictions as to the next weird thing to uh, delay. A uh, okay, so I bet there's a technical difficulty that just mm. causes a speaker to shoot out white noise. Just yes, <sighs> feedback. Some yeah, absolute just feedback. That's my that's my guess. We're gonna have a feedback white noise delay. Or like some poorly timed music. Like if you go back to 2013 when that happened at Chase Field, I remember that one. Uh, between the I Mets and the Diamondbacks. I, I do. Well, I do. Uh, basically, in the audio room, I, I don't know, somebody like pushed a button too early or something, and some blurring music just played as a pitch was about to be delivered and a stoppage hit for a quick sec. Outstanding. And at that time, everyone's laughing and laughing, and you're thinking to yourself, man, how abnormal. Now, this is like, I'm almost expecting that to happen. The question is where? Yeah. Oh, we had a player get kicked out of a game. So Derek Holland, he was, he had, he got kicked out of the game while yes. he was sitting in the stands before he had ever even appeared in a game in uniform for the Pirates. He got thrown out of a game. Uh, that was another weird thing that happened this year. Here's an actual like weird baseball thing that has happened this year. Um, the A's already have two walk-off grand slams. And I think if I was paying attention earlier, I think they're the first team in baseball history to have two walk-off grand slams in one year. And that happened in like two weeks. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. Every other team had 162 or I guess 154 or how many games they used to have before that. And uh, no, they did it in their like first 12 games or whatever. And both in tie games in the bottom of the inning. 
So like an extra Both innings. On the first pitch of the at bat. I forgot who hit one uh, against the Angels on opening day for them. I forgot who it was. Uh, I don't remember. But no. um, but yeah, the apparent legend of Stephen Piscotty. Yeah. Um, it was. I can tell you this. Give me just one moment. Matt Olson on opening day. Okay. Matt Olson, I can see on those. They got some pop though in their lineup. They have yeah. some. They have some uh, underrated pop. Chapman, Kenna. Even Chris Davis, who is never probably going to hit for a whole lot of average, but 40 home run threat for a while. What else do they have on that team? Oh, Chris uh, Davis, the new Chris Davis, this time with yeah, the K. Right. So. Uh, let's see. Marcus Simeon has been hitting for more power lately. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I think the A's, especially with the injury to Verlander, I think the A's have taken over, and my favorite to win the, the division – um, Especially with the offense heating up, because I know the offense was a little bit scuffling of late, like in the same, well, not as big of a wavelength as the Rangers have, because the Rangers offense, just when you think they're going to get it going, yeah. another uh, another brick wall hits. So yeah. what do you, because the only thing I could think of is go on an offensive roll, off day, and then it just seems like you're reverted back to old habits, per se. I don't know if they're actually having old habits, but what is uh, – do you think that's just – You know, I haven't really been able to dig into it and kind of wanted to give it a little bit bigger sample size before I tried to offer any sort of an, a hypothesis because, like, you'll, you'll see at bats where guys are chasing pitches, but then also – you know, guys that are kind of known for chasing. Rugnet Odor, I've seen him strike out a couple of times looking already. Um, Shinsu Chu has been very hot and cold. Uh, so I, I don't know that I can <clears throat> really identify a common theme that has caused it. It just seems like, I mean, maybe some of it is just a, a little bit of bad luck. You know, when you're putting together a few good at-bats in a game sometimes, like the 2016 Rangers – I think the, the phrase that started to become common about them was cluster luck because they would get like five hits a game, but they were all in the same inning. And so they'd score three, you know, three or four runs in that inning and, and win the game. Uh, I feel like the Rangers have had kind of the opposite of that. It's not, you know, they, they've had some hits, they've had some walks, their on base percentage isn't great. Their batting average kind of sucks, but some of that's bad. Um, but it just seems like they, their hits that they get, they're not stringing them together all at once. And that's, how you win baseball games. And that's kind of the common denominator between, well, two of their, and, and even if you want to count opening day, if you're going to have three hits in a game, might as well have two back to back, mm -hmm. two extra base hits. And yep. there's your one tally. And then yep. the win against Arizona, five run eighth inning, win against San Francisco. I mean, it's common denominator between those three victories. Yeah, I'm looking at the San Francisco right, one right now. I'm trying to remember what their big inning was on that one. They had a um, remember they had the bases loaded of walks to load the bases, that's right? And that's then the right. sack fly by Willie, and then Joey that's capped right. it off. And then the big, the big three. Yeah, that's right. I remember uh, I was talking to Heather, my wife, after the game, and I'm like, it's good to see them score that many runs, but it's not like they, like, first of all, they gave up a five to one lead, which is bad, yep. and then when they won, there was really one big hit. Like the rest of it, the Giants gave them that game. Yeah. Uh, who was it Triggs was it, that walked three guys? Yeah, and... Triggs, who I believe, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, just was taken off the injured list. It was his first game back. I think so, yeah. And then yeah, so. basically walked the bases loaded. And there's yeah. your three batter minimum. Mm hmm. Well, just like from what we saw last night with the. Uh... <laughs> Edison Volquez. Yep. Walk, single walk. And there's your three batter minimum. So, yeah, pitching is weird. Baseball is weird. Everything's weird. Um, and it, it's so, like, it's too early in the season to really be like, it's, it's weird. It's a weird juxtaposition because on one hand, you're like, we're only nine games into the season. How are we going to freak out about a nine game thing and try to project how the rest of the season's going based on nine games? That's not how we're used to analyzing baseball. On the other hand, when the Rangers hit 
10 games tonight, they're going to be a sixth of the way through the season. They're going to be, it, it would be like being what, 27 games into a regular season. At that point, you're kind of starting to figure out what your team is. And so it's like, you, you have to make those decisions earlier on sort of what the team is, but at the same time, because the season's so short, if they go on a six game winning streak, which even bad teams can do, well, that, that might be enough to get them into the playoffs. So how, how are you supposed to make sense of this? The Orioles sweep of the Tampa Bay Rays is a perfect example. Three game yes. sweep. You're thinking to yourself in a normal season, that's a bad weekend for the Rays. Mm-hmm. Now that's a bad weekend for a Rays yeah. team that could challenge if anyone's going to challenge the Yankees in that division, it's the Rays, yeah. and they may have just lost their chance. After today, they will be done. Texas will be done. 17% of their season would be completed. Yeah, okay. 17%. That's a lot. I mean, it's not – like, it's a lot, but it, it, I'm still having a hard time, like, making sense of it in my brain because it is a lot, but also – just a few wins in a row will f- fix that over the course of the next 17% of the season, right? And the Rangers, too, also, they have to make these decisions by the end of August because that's when the trade deadline is this year. And then mm-hmm. you've got some guys, whether that be Mike Miner or Lance Lynn. Um, I mean, probably only those two. It's not like Todd Frazier has really made himself into a uh, super target for, for a trade uh, acquisition, but you got to make some decisions on those guys. Are those guys that you're going to go ahead and trade Kyle Gibson, Jordan Lyles. I mean, how weird that the Rangers are looking at their starting pitcher pitching as something that they can deal from a position of strength. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, these are decisions that it's not just us trying to make sense of it. It's also the teams trying to figure out, like, we got to look at 2021, look at this process that we're getting ourselves into as far as trying to become contenders do we keep those guys? Do we sell those? Let's sell those guys. Do we trade those guys? Um, yeah, it's. I do not envy the people who have to make these decisions. Like if I mess up on this, and I analyze it wrong, the worst I'm going to get is like roasted on the internet, right? Somebody's going to be like, "This idiot." You guy can get it right and get roasted on the internet. Yeah. Uh, John Daniels and company, they get it wrong. That's that's a real legitimate yeah. like franchise defining thing. So. Could be the difference between making the postseason or not in 2021 or even this year. If you make a, if you make a hell of a trade. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So I don't, I don't envy. I'm glad I'm not in charge of that. That's what I'm trying to say. Biggest question. Are you even going to get to the end of August? That's well, yeah. Yeah. And then as far as like, so as far as the trade, market goes you know you've got these guys that you are first of all you're only so what would help a seller in the trade market is if there are more teams in contention right Mm -hmm. more teams that want to bolster their their likelihood of winning a world series well you've got that not just because it's a shortened season and everything's pressed a little closer together but because we've got the expanded playoffs this year Mm -hmm. so we're gonna have more teams to get into the into the fray on the flip side of that um, when you know, with the trade deadline usually being at the end of July, you get August and September with that with that player if it's a rental. But for whatever you know, maybe there's one extra month. seasons in the future. But for this year, you've got those two months. This year, you only get one month mm-hmm. plus the, the postseason. And then secondly, how much do teams value uh, a push into the postseason this year as opposed to coming years? So hey, I got a chance to maybe make the playoffs this year but are we really going to send off a couple of prospects that could help us in 2022 and beyond so that we can chance being in contention in a season that could end at any moment exactly there is a there's a very real possibility some team goes all right this is our chance we're the baltimore orioles (laughs) and, (laughs) and some things broke right and it looks like we're gonna make the playoffs here are two prospects in exchange for you know, I would probably not Lance Lynn. He's got an extra year left on his contract, but some, you know, some pitcher that is uh, on an expiring deal. And then the very next day, 75 players around the league test positive and MLB goes, that's it. We're done. So you got that guy for one day, didn't even play a game for your team and you've lost two prospects. 
and that's a, that's very much in the realm of possibilities. So, I mean, I would love to, and I don't think any GMs would necessarily talk about it completely on the record, but I would love to just sit down with all 30 GMs and be like, all right, so how are you approaching this? And I think you'd probably get 30 different answers. Exactly. And I think for a team like Baltimore, I think you take the chance because when you're going to have another chance, are you, do you really think they would have a chance with this roster in 162 games compared to no, of course not. a team like I'm trying to think of who's in the middle of the pack right now. I would guess maybe Houston in the American league, Cleveland, who's kind of in the middle right now, who's been kind of off mm. and on. Yeah, I would say Houston's probably closer to the top, but, um, but I mean, let's take somebody let's who take has a, who has a legit chance next year is basically the point. I'm trying let's to look make. at the, Let's look at the A's, I think. I mean, I think the A's are a good example. They are a very good team. Nobody expected them to win the division, but they were a wild card team last year. So, sure. Do you take um, that chance? And honestly, to me, I say for a team like Oakland, no. I, don't, I, I personally wouldn't because, like you said, it could end so abruptly. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think you think about it a little bit more. I think if you're a team or Miami's 3-1, and one, for lack of a better term. So if you foresee those teams getting hot with a month left. I almost see it the exact opposite because I think if you are Miami or Baltimore, you you never planned to compete this year anyway. And Mm -hmm. so if you do happen to luck out and get into the playoffs, it's like kind of like a bonus. Like, Oh, that's great. Love it. Love that for our fans so that they can see us in the playoffs. But really, that was never our goal in the first place. Our goal was, as we're rebuilding, that we're looking at 2022, 23, 24. That's what we've been stockpiling talent to go compete in those years. Hey, man, we luck out in this weird season. Great. But we're not going to take away from players that could help us in those years to try and take a gamble on this year, which is not really what we were ever planning on anyway. So... Uh, whereas a team uh, like Oakland, who I think, you know, this year, and then they're going to have to make some decisions on guys in, in arbitration and in, in a free agent market, like this might be a year for Oakland where they go, their cycle has been build up this great talent, get it to the point where it becomes free agency, and then they don't have the budget to sign their big stars. So they trade them for other younger, great talent that's going to come up back up through the system and help them again in a few years and then they'll trade those guys for, you know, like that, that kind of seems to be their cycle. And if they're at the top of that cycle right now, which they are, I think that's probably a team that would be more interested in competing because look, if 2020 came along and blew us up and we were expecting, expecting to contend this year, next year we see these challenges coming. Let's go for it this year, even though it's a shortened season. And that's just how I see it. But like you said, there, there's, there are two completely different ways to look at it. Do you think there'll be more activity or less activity now that more teams have a shot? There'll be more less. cat and mouse games. I think, yeah, I, I, I got to think less just because of the uncertainty of it all. You know, if I can argue this point against myself, um, I can only imagine GMs arguing it against each other. Like, I know what a buyer's argument is going to be. I'm going to pay you bottom dollar because I don't know if there's a season tomorrow. Exactly. And if I'm a seller, like, well, then I'm not motivated to send you a player if I'm not getting anything in return. So why would I? Uh, so I think you probably get less less action than usual would be my guess. That's what I'm which thinking probably too. means Which probably means there's going to be a ton of action <laughs> just because <laughs> Universe has a way of keeping me humble. Last, I tell you, last day. You're not going to, I don't think you're going to see too much action before, but I mm. think last day, the floodgates are going to open. If hmm. there's a lot of activity, because like you said, cat and mouse game, right? You're going to be, it, it's, I always say it's kind of like going to a pawn shop or kind of go into a flea market and haggling. There's mm-hmm. going to be a lot of haggling. Yeah. And then at some point you're going to be like, all right, well, store closes in 30 seconds. See you later. And decide if they're going to go, wait, 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 wait. Okay, fine. I always thought that's usually how it goes, but I think this year even more yeah. because of the circumstances. Yeah. Yeah. And I just think the gulf between how buyers see the market and how sellers see the market is probably so broad that I just think, it, I think we see a lot of those where the, the moment comes 
well, see you later. And the proverbial storekeeper goes, don't let the door hit you on the way out. Bye. Yeah. So I, I think, um, yeah, it'll be interesting to, in, interesting to watch. And then this week, so the Rangers are finishing up a series against Oakland. Only trip to Oakland. They will head home to take on the Angels first time mm-hmm. this year. And honestly, like you said, it just takes one swing game to get things going. Like last night, one nothing game, heading late, final few innings. I mean, you're able to pull that one out, first game on the road against the A's. That's huge. Yeah, yeah and I – man, I was really thinking with the Rangers being three and five, like if they can – if they can get this win tonight against the A's, you got Lance Lynn on the on the mound. You're four and five. You've beaten the A's. Man, if you can take two out of three against them, you may have salvaged this thing. To lose that game, uh, especially in the way that they lost it, I feel like that was really a big. You know, for it being the what do we say? The nine games. What are they? Three and six. For it being the ninth game of the year, it feels like the biggest ninth game of the year that I certainly can ever remember. That seems that it that seemed like to be, and again, it's a six, eight, ten game winning streak completely erases all of this. Right. It feels for it being so early in the season, uh, that that felt like kind of a dagger for a team that started off slow and needed a needed a turnaround game. I'm curious to see what's going to happen these next five, six games, no off day, see if that momentum gets going see mm-hmm. if they can get something going offensively because it just – now it's hard to say because you got Lazardo who pitched yesterday, you got mm-hmm. Manaya today, and fires – I mean, okay. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, fires is good. Um, he's not – he's not an ace. He's somebody you should be able to beat. So I, I'm curious to see the attack approach. Tonight's going to be tough because I know M- Manaya is no joke. So mm-hmm. pretty much the same offensive alignment. And then, of course, you've got injuries rolling around. Santana's out. Odor's uh, shelved on the bench. So you're not getting so much consistency as you'd like. I know there's mm-hmm. talk of – You know, Dolis Garcia has struggled. You don't really have a consistent bat outside Gallo. And I mean, I would say even if you want to put Heineman in the consistency area. Heineman's been better than most. Um, He is, I just want to take a look here to make sure I've got my numbers exactly right. Uh, I mean, yeah, he's still only hitting 188 though. Like he's had some really good at bats and his right. hits have looked really good, but he's still hitting 188. I mean, here's your, here's as far as last night, guys who were in the lineup last night, you want to know who had the highest batting average? I'm trying to think off the top of my head. Uh, you mean like for the season? For the season. At the end of last game among guys who were, in fact, I can probably pull this up where I've got the, the team leaders instead, just to make sure there's not somebody I'm leaving off. So, um, let me let me pull this up here. So let's pull up stats. Uh, batting average. Okay, so the guy that I'm talking about is not he's not a qualifier. He has not qualified for the team lead in batting average. Don't cheat. I see you looking at things down there. Don't cheat. Not a qualifier. The qualify. I'll, I'll give you this. The qualifying leader for the Rangers is Joey Gallo. He's hitting yeah. 303. Did you find out who it was that is? I can think the of it off the top. Is it Jeff Mathis? No. Uh, oh, oh, actually, no, it might be Jeff Mathis. So I did I stump him. you before you stumped me? Yeah, no, he, well, Mathis wasn't in the lineup last night. I was talking about Robert F. Snyder. Oh, okay. Robert okay. F. Snyder is hitting you said You said in the lineup, so that, that's yeah. my bad. Yeah, but, but I mean, when you look at last night's lineup, you've got um, – let's just look this up real quick. You've got your leadoff hitter. Elvis Andrews hitting 156. You've got Nick Solak, who is the exciting young bat, 185. Gallo at 303. Todd Frazier at 233 because he had a three-hit game. Uh, Robinson Trinos, 158. Scott Heineman, 188. Isaiah Kinder-Falefa, 273. That's about where you expect him. 
uh, Adolis Garcia, zero. Uh, Shin Su Chu, who pinch hit late in the game, 143. And Rob Ruff Snyder, 444. And I know batting average is obviously a you know, old-timey stat that doesn't tell us the whole story, but it can tell you part of the story. And the part okay. of the story it's telling is a sad part of the story. Well, I think it was a perfect example where in the victories, I think uh, prior to last night's game, in the victories, the Rangers, uh, as far as scoring runs go, they scored uh, off the top of my head like 17 runs in their victories. Mm -hmm. Much lower. uh, I think it's right around like 17, probably less than that. It's probably like 13 or 14. Again, don't have it off the top of my head. But in their losses, I mean – you could tell if they're able to put across four or five runs or even like four yeah. runs, you got a good chance. Yeah. Let's see in their wins. They've had three wins. So one plus seven plus nine, right? So 17 yep. uh, losses. You want to do some quick math as I call out numbers. Yep. All right. Uh, two, two, one, uh, two, Three, one. Eleven. Okay. So there's that. I was By the way, Jeff Mathis is hitting Jeff Mathis is hitting five hundred, so you were correct on that. Attaboy, Jeff yeah. Mathis. Eleven runs combined in their six losses, seventeen combined in their three wins. Which I guess makes sense. A little bit. I always say as far as phases of the game you have to at least have two phases working if you have any chance to win. Mm-hmm. Offense, defense, pitching. Yeah. You even branch out pitching was, to... The defense was so bad in the first series against Colorado. It just seemed like they could not get it together. I think it's been better since then. I mean, it's it been... Like I don't remember seeing as many misplays in the last few games. No, no, me either. I mean, you might have one or two here. Base running... There's a little bit, um, mm-hmm. you know, I think people were condoning Isaiah a little bit too much for his try yesterday. I didn't have a problem with it because on, from my perspective, I thought it would have taken an amazing play to tag mm-hmm. him out and an amazing play yeah. is exactly what happened. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I think that's a high, I think that's a high uh, percentage move to make. I actually don't know that enough about Sean Murphy to know. Is he known for having a particularly strong arm behind the plate? Um, not anything spectacular that I've heard. Okay. That's, I'm admitting my lack of knowledge there. I don't know. So maybe that influences the decision if he is, but still, you know, ball in the dirt. Kiner Fluff is a relatively fast guy. And you're right. Chap- it's like a perfect play to get in. Chapman's playing yeah. back. Mm-hmm. Here's something. Okay. I'm debating if I want to bring this up or if I want to try and write a story about it, but whatever, I'll just bring you it can, up. You can bring it up because nobody's going to listen to this. Uh, um, <laughs> so I've noticed something last night, Nick Solak, uh, as, as there was a stolen base attempt and Solak was doing what I was taught to do when I played second base, which is his left. I could show you, but let's try and put this in words. His left foot, you know, obviously he's facing first base and the ball is coming from his right as he's facing sort of perpendicular to the pitcher to catcher line. And his left foot is on the back part of the bag, right? So he's basically straddling the base and the ball comes in and he catches and makes the tag. Uh, the only reason that I noticed that because I, that's normal, I wouldn't have noticed it otherwise is there have been two or three occasions this year where the Rangers are on defense and this is before Ruth Nedador is injured and the Ball comes to second on a stolen base and Odor has both feet and he's about a body length closer to the catcher. Like he's in front of the bag and he's like catching and then turning to dive at the player. And I've noticed this a couple of times and I don't know why that's happening. I don't know if that's something that he's been taught to do or like the ball is getting to me faster. Like what, have you noticed this? I haven't really noticed it. Um, but I feel like that would create, and again, I, I've never played second base, but I feel like that would create more, you'd have more room for error in doing that. It is a lot more difficult. Right. Well, and you're not moving as fast as the ball. Right. Once you catch the ball and turn around and dive, like right. you have slowed down the path of the ball. So that's, 
I don't understand why he's doing that. And I'm going to, I'm going to get to the bottom of it. We talked to infield coaches and. Uh, you heard it and, here. Levi, the detective. Yeah. yeah. It's on the case. Somebody's going to scoop me on this now that I brought it up, but I just, I didn't know if that was something you had noticed. Um, Cause I just, I thought it was really weird. But yeah, no, I could see where that would be because the less motion you can do when you catch the ball, the easiest it's mm. going to be and the quickest it's going to, that's why fantastic plays are a little less motion done for yeah. the most point. Like when you're able to gun down speedsters on the bases, like a D Gordon. Efficiency, right? Yeah. Right. You want to make it as well, simple I mean, as possible. Look at the tag from Javi Baez a couple of days ago. He did the thing again where he like puts his hand up ahead of time and he's catching the ball with one hand, like not even looking at the runner and he makes the tag, yeah. but he caught that ball. Dr. Pepper can is the runner's leg. He, he literally caught the ball like right there. Exactly. Just, so I don't know. I'm going to break it down. I'm going to figure out how to play second base again. It's been a long time. And <laughs> see if there's any possible benefit to playing in front of the bag like that. All right. So, yep, we've got uh, more Rangers baseball coming up this week and throughout the month. Hopefully we'll see what, We'll see what happens on there. But uh, Levi, really appreciate you coming on, giving yeah, thanks. the beautiful insights. And of course, well, you heard it here as I'm far as detective those, work. But... That's, what, that's what we do. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And we'll uh, see you when we see you. Thank you so much. And I uh, want to thank everybody. You can follow Levi Weaver on The Athletic and on Twitter. You can follow me on Twitter at aplinktx and on Instagram at aplinktex. And we will see you next time. Thank you all for listening and enjoy some Rangers baseball. Mm-hmm.